Good evening and welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study. I'm Craig Dubinsky and we are at Enola Church of God in Enola, Pennsylvania. And we are studying the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is an awesome study. We began this last year in 2020 and I completed the letters to the seven churches in Revelation 1 through 3. And then this year, 21-22, this uh, series is Revelation 4 through 22. So why don't we begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll begin our Bible study tonight. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come together to study the Scriptures so that we might be better equipped, that we might be better prepared to be able to be witnesses for you and to let everyone know for, of the reason for the hope that is in us, that we might testify of Jesus Christ, that we might let everybody know that he did come Christmas Day as a babe in a manger, but he's no longer a babe. He was crucified for our sins, risen from the dead, and he is exalted, ascended into heaven, and he is seated at the right hand of God. And his work is complete. From the cross, he said, it is finished. And we thank you, God, for salvation in Jesus Christ that you have given to us as a free gift. And we trust you, and we are loyal to you. And we're studying tonight so that we can learn more about you, God, and become more like you. Open our eyes, open our ears, help us to see and hear and understand your word that you have written for our edification and your glory. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, I'm opening my Bible to Revelation chapter 6. And this is the seven seals. The seven seals. And the context of Revelation 6 is the tribulation period. And if you remember... Uh, as you've been following along with us in Revelation 1, it was present day, about 90, in the 90s, 93, 94, 95 AD. John is in a prison, uh, a Roman prison on a Greek island in the Aegean Sea, Patmos. And he uh, is given these words, the inspired word of God. And then in chapters 2 and 3, we did the letters to the seven churches and we went through uh, Thyatira and Pergamus and Laodicea and the other ones. And we learned a great deal about um, our relationship with the Lord and how that we need to learn to be loyal and completely to Jesus Christ. And then in um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18, we learned that the church was raptured up. And the word rapture in the Latin means caught up or catched, caught up or catched up. And um, so the church is in heaven in this period of Revelation. We looked at heaven from Revelation 4 and 5. We looked at the worship. We talked about the angels. And there's a big uh, handout upstairs on angelology that I wrote and uh, put together. Uh, part of it is from the Systematic Theology of Grudem, Wayne Grudem, and I added some notes to it. We talked about cherubim, we talked about seraphim, we talked about angels, we talked about the archangel, and all of the servants of God, the messengers of God, as they serve God at his wish and his direction. And tonight, we're back in chapter six, and um, we've looked at, um, we're looking at the horses. We've looked at the white horse, which was page one. Page two, verses three and four is another horse, fiery red. We talked about that standing for global war. We talked about the birth pains, uh, which was a metaphor used by the Old Testament prophets for intense pain. And where we are tonight is in verse 4. So why don't we read through um, Revelation 6, and I'm going to read through verses 1 through 8. 
Now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say, with a loud voice like thunder, Come! And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him. And he came out, conquering, and to conquer. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come! And out came another horse, bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth, so that the people should slay one another. And he was given a great sword. Verse 5, And when he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come! And I looked, and behold, a black horse, and its rider had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and wine. And verse 7, And he opened the fourth seal. I heard a voice of the four living creatures say, Come! And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and its rider's name was Death, and Hades followed him. And they were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword, and with famine, and with pestilence, and with wild beasts. And that's Revelation 6, 1 to 8, and I'm going to stop there. And on your sheet... I have to grab one thing from my briefcase. I'm using John MacArthur's Revelation, The Christian's Ultimate Victory. He has some study notes in this excellent study guide, and I've been following along with these notes as we go along, and I'm going to read uh, a couple of things from there in just one moment. Okay, so in verse 4, it says, And he came out, another horse, bright red, its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth, so that the people should slay one another, and was given a great sword. John MacArthur has a note on that word sword, and he says that this was not the normal long broadsword, that the Roman soldiers carried, but rather a shorter, more easily maneuverable one that assassins often used and that soldiers carried into battle. It's kind of like a, like a dagger, I guess, if you will. And uh, it depicts assassination, revolt, massacre, and really wholesale slaughter. You will see easily that there is an escalation of violence during the tribulation period. You've seen it already, and you're going to see it more and more as we go through these passages. This is unprecedented violence, like Harrisburg, like Chicago, like New York, only a thousand <laughs> times worse. Even last night, as I watched the 10 o'clock news, I was horrified at what I heard, and it's the violence of another school shooting. Did you hear about that? I heard this mm -hmm. morning about it. Somebody ex tell me about that. I think it's heard it was a 15-year-old kid shooting, and then I think 14, 15, and 17-year-olds killed another somewhere. One, I don't remember. Another one died today. Oh, did they? That's exactly right. And I have an article here from the Detroit Free Press, and this was updated as of Wednesday, 12.22 p.m. A fourth victim, 17-year-old Justin Schilling, died due to his injuries at 10 a.m. Wednesday, that's today, at McLaren Oakland Hospital, the Oakland County Sheriff's Office said. <clears throat> What happened is, a 15-year-old Oxford High School sophomore, armed with a semi-automatic handgun, is accused of shooting at his school Tuesday afternoon, killing three students and injuring seven, 
Well, that's obviously killing four students and injuring uh, six now because of the person who passed away. I have the names. I'm not going to read the full name. I'm going to read the first name in the ages. It's Tate, 16. Hannah, 14. Madison, 17. And Justin, 17. These are the children that were slaughtered by a fellow student in Oxford High School in Ohio. This is, this is despicable. I mean, do you remember this 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 40 years ago? I don't. And this is not isolated. This is one of many uh, school shootings. And I only bring this up because some people say, you know, the Bible's full of uh, exaggerations. It's full of things that could never happen. It's full of things that are taken uh, too far. Well, when the Bible says that there's going to be an escalation in violence, we're already seeing it. To those who have eyes to see and ears to hear. It will be worse. The rebellion, the hatred, the prejudice, the murderous spirit of mankind will increase and it will come to a peak during the tribulation period as men fight and kill. Why? Because they don't want to follow authority. And in this case, it's God's authority. It's not the, the, the blue uniform that they're fighting against in the tribulation period. It's not that authority, the civil authority. It's higher than that. It's God's authority. And you're going to see this over and over, because when we get further in the Revelation, you'll learn that people through the Revelation not only um, disrespect God, but they actually curse him to his face. And I have places that I will show you where they do that. And I'm like, wow, that's, that's amazing to me. It's one thing to disbelieve. It's one thing to disregard, but to blatantly curse God, and they do it, and you'll see it. Okay, I am thankful that the Church of Jesus Christ is where? In us. Pardon? In us, you mean? Well, Church. remember, we're in the future. Oh. So in the future, we're in the tribulation period. We're not okay. in the tribulation period yeah. now. Yeah. You're not mixing this up thinking we're in the tribulation period now, are you? Because we're not. Yeah. The tribulation period didn't happen. Did not happen, okay? And it did not happen because the rapture did not happen. Yeah. Okay. And if the rapture happened, you know what that makes all of us? Non-believers. Because yeah. the believers go up with right, Jesus. Right. They're caught up in the air and meet the Lord in the air, and so shall they ever be with the Lord. Well, the rapture didn't happen, and so the tribulation didn't start. Okay, so we are in the future. So try and remember where we are. I mean, in reality, this is December 1st, 2021. But in this Bible study, we are in the future because that's where we are in the text. Where are we in the future? What's the date we're at in the future? I don't know because I don't know when the rapture is going to be and nobody does. And the tribulation follows the rapture. So we are sometime in the future, but we're talking about the tribulation period. Revelation 6 to Revelation 18. You got that? 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. All of that is the tribulation period, which spans how many years? Seven. Good, seven. So... If we're in the tribulation period in our study, and that's where we are in Revelation 6, where is the church? In heaven. It's, not heaven. it's in heaven. Thank God. So we are not in this. We are not part of this. And we are in glory, glorified with the Lord. But the earth is spinning in an out-of-control way, maybe not physically, but certainly spiritually, because people uh, are getting further and further from God, 
And people are cursing God. And as we get further into Revelation, you'll see they're going to accept the mark of the beast. You're going to see that they're going to worship a false Christ. You're going to see that they revere a imitation Jesus Christ. And the Antichrist and the false prophet are experts in deception because they are empowered by the father of all lies. Where's that? John 8, 44. You are of your father the devil. He is a liar and a murderer and the father of all lies, it says in John 8, 44. So Satan is the power and the Antichrist, who's a person, and the false prophet, who is a person, is going to have all kind of false Christs, uh, false uh, prophets, and the world is going to follow it hook, line, and sinker. I mean, it's going to be a mess. We love you, whatever. Where does that leave God? Kind of out in the cold, right? Because mankind has turned his back on God. And God is going to do some evangelism in the tribulation. We'll see that when we get to the 144,000. And people are going to be gloriously saved. But they're not going to be Christians for 20 years. You know why? Somebody tell me why. <laughs> this is a trick question. It's not hard. Tribulation period is how many years? Seven. Right. And they're going to be martyred and massacred. Yeah. Right? right? So the oldest Christian that's going to come out of the tribulation is going to be how old in the faith? Hypothetically? Young. Young? Young. How many years old? Well, if they're saved during the tribulation period and the tribulation period ends, they've only been in the faith how many years? Well, seven. 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 seven is the max. Seven is the max. So you're not going to have a lot of old veteran Christians like some of you have been saved for 30 years. Some of you have been saved for 40 years. You know, you've been saved a while, so you have a maturation, a spiritual maturity. But these people in the tribulation are going to be fighting and warring against God. God's going to pour out his spirit. People are going to be responding. The people are going to be saved, but it's not going to be long because... Uh, if they don't accept the mark of the beast, what happens? They're out, right? And uh, so many will be massacred, many will be slaughtered, and they go to heaven. They've been in the faith maybe one day, maximal, maximal is seven years. Can't be longer than seven because tribulation is only seven years. And some will be at different points. Does that make sense? Okay. So, let's go to verse 5 and 6. Could I have somebody read verses 5 and 6? Just, just go ahead and read it when you're ready. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see, and I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat... For a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Okay, great. So there's quite a few uh, things we're going to fill in here. So we see the black horse, and um, John MacArthur has a couple of thoughts on that. I'm going to read John first. John says black signifies famine. Uh, and worldwide war will destroy the food supply and spawn global hunger. Hunger. Well, you know what? You're, you're starting to experience a little of this right now, right? Because the food supply line is interrupted, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I think I mentioned in Bible study once that uh, Pam and I went to uh, uh, Arby's, got a sandwich and milkshake. They didn't have any milkshakes. I said... What happened? And they said, well, the company that supplies the milkshakes also supplies the machines. And when the machines break down, we don't have anybody to fix them. So Pam said, well, let's go to McDonald's. So we went to McDonald's. I said, do you, have, you do have milkshakes, right? Said, oh, yeah, yeah, we got milkshake. Oh, good, good. So we got a milkshake. Gave us our bag. I said, can I have two skulls? 
He said, oh, we don't have any straws. <laughs> I said, what happened to the straws? He said, well, our supplier didn't come in, and we're in short supply of everything. I drove away, and I'm like, what? <laughs> then we went to Arugas. Anybody been to Arugas? Nobody? You have, Jason? We like the ribs at Arugas. I called Arugas up. I said, do you have an indoor dining? Oh, yeah, we have indoor dining. Do you have everything on the menu? Oh, yeah, we have everything on the menu. You're not short of anything? No, we're not short of anything. Good. So we went to Arugas. Sat down, got our water with lemon in it, and... You know, we didn't even need a menu because we always get the same thing. We always get ribs. So we're sitting there salivating, you know, can't wait. We're going to get these ribs, you know, and Pam's, you know, grinding her teeth. Like, <laughs> so here comes our waitress, right? She says, what do you have? I said, we'll have two ribs. She said, we don't have any ribs. Oh my God. I said, I called. She said, well, uh, the person you talked to didn't know that half, the, half of our supplies didn't come in. So, what's going on? No milkshakes, no straws, no ribs, okay? We went to Audi's, and we like Audi's, by the way. Some people don't like Audi's. We love Audi's. And not, we went there today, but the last time we went there, Audi, A-L-D-I, yeah, Audi. Yeah, grocery store. Yeah, sometimes, okay. I get, I, sometimes I make a mistake, and I'll say Ollie's instead of Audi's. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I'm talking about Audi's the food. Yeah. Anyway... Last time we went to Audi's, we liked their uh, their sausages. They have these uh, uh, cheddar brats, and they have these uh, different sausages they have, and they're pretty good price, about $2 a pound less than uh, uh, the number one supermarket in the area. I won't say what it is, because I don't want to be demeaning <laughs> to a supermarket. But everybody knows who it is, because it's number one. Anyway, uh, guess how many, and they usually have four, five, or six varieties of these sausages, you know, with cheese and with jalapenos and with uh, this and with that, without that. They didn't have any. Oh so I God. said to the girl, I said, what happened to the sausages? She said, our meat uh, supply is, uh, we're not getting much meat in. Okay. So we went today. They had one variety, and I bought six of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's why they're short. <laughs> well, actually, they had plenty today. They had, you know, they have these boxes, and then they have boxes behind the boxes, yeah. you know, and boxes behind the boxes. So they had a lot of them, but they only had that one variety. And I'm like, I'm like, what's going on? Why can't we get our food? Well, we know that part of the problem is because of the COVID and all of the ramifications of COVID. You know, some people will say, well, COVID is a conspiracy, or COVID is this, COVID is that. Well, whatever it is, okay, whether you believe it is or isn't or whatever, it has created some havoc in, uh, in buying and selling, hasn't it? Yes. And uh, part of the problem, I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, and I brought in a, a, an article. I had a picture from the New York Times of uh, the Los Angeles Bay, and at that time, at that date, there were 63 cargo ships anchored off of Los Angeles that couldn't yeah, unload. Yeah, I saw that. And I'm like, that's where my sausages are. They're <laughs> out there floating. <laughs> now, Facebook did a joke on that. Facebook picked up on that. And somebody had a post. It was a professional post. And it had Black Friday sale and all these people swimming out to the cargo ship. <laughs> oh, my. I wish life were that simple, but it isn't, is it? So, uh, so that's the story. So anyway, uh, inflation, famine, starvation, like the conditions in Jerusalem when Babylon sieged and destroyed Jerusalem in 587 B.C. Um, when I first started teaching Sunday school here this, this time around that we came back around, that would be somewhere late 2019, early 2020, I was teaching Nehemiah, and we were at that section right here, Ezra and Nehemiah, which is the rebuilding of the wall and the rebuilding of, of Jerusalem. And, and Jerusalem was, was sieged and burned and destroyed, and it happened again. When did it happen again? Jesus said that not one stone will remain upon another stone 
in this place. He was talking about the temple, the Jewish temple. And when was that destroyed? He's got it. 100 bucks for him. Anybody else remember? I'll tell you who did it. The Romans did it. The Romans hated the Jews. The, remember, there's been many temples, right, through yeah. Jewish history, through yeah. biblical history. You know, there was Solomon's temple, and then there was uh, the Zerubbabel temple, and then there was the Herod temple. Well, that and wasn't this really is the same his. building? The same building? I mean, remember... Well, the same the spot. Same, not that's what the I, same well, spot. that's what I mean. They just kept rebuilding. Yeah, that's You know what, what it is? I'll tell you what it is. In Mechanicsburg, do you know where... Um, wait a minute. It changed names three times. Pam, do you remember where Toy, Toys R Us used to be? McCarl Pike. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you remember? Mm -hmm. What would you call it? To tell her where that is exactly. Well, it's on the Carlisle Pike. Yeah, it's right across the street from my work. Mm -hmm. It's right across the street from work. Well, she, Toys R Us closed, and it became Babies R Us. Yeah, no that idea. closed, and then it became something else. And I forgot the third thing it became. Do you remember? No, it's it's REI now. Yeah, right? now it's REI uh, co-op. Co yeah, well, it isn't anymore. They're tearing it down. I just went past it today, and uh, they're wiping it out. Oh, you're you're talking about the one over Camp Hill Mall. No. Yeah, that's no, not Camp no, Hill no, Mall. No, 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 no. I'm talking about the Carlisle Pike. Yes. I just saw it today. Uh, oh, you're talking about that not tearing it down. restaurant and that hotel. Oh, yeah, that was in the news yesterday, the paper. Oh, yeah, that that's that old hotel. Oh, where Wanda's used to be and all that, right? That's that was Wanda's years and ago. Crossing the Gateway Shop. It's like across the street from what... No, I'm not talking about that one. Listen, when you get off Exit 3, yeah. Exit 3, and you're coming around and you get on the Carlisle Pike, you know, Dukes is there and all that, yeah. and you're coming down the Carlisle Pike, before you get to Wegmans, before you get there, on the right-hand side... There used to be a very large building. That was Toys R Us. Then it became Babies R Us, and now it doesn't yeah, exist yeah. at all. They've mowed it down. And oh. it's a big area. Do you know what that is? I, I'm, I'm, the reason I'm not speaking is because I, I'm so close to the thing. I, I, I thought they were right. I, I thought that um, that was changed into REI, but yeah. I could be wrong, but there might... Yeah. Whatever, there's another building there probably that they're tearing down. Yeah. yeah no, there's no well, I'm, I'm, I'm not debating that, that what you're saying is inaccurate. What, what I'm talking about is an empty lot that has, hmm. that they've taken the whole thing out. That's what I'm talking Isn't about. That a vital store? There was a vital store there, I thought. That was like where the house almost. I went by it tonight. It was dark. I don't know. Oh, it's, you mean right aside of the yeah. parking lot for Toys R Us? Yeah. Yeah, there was right a, it used the to be same. like a house and business. Yeah, it was like a bridal store at one yeah. point, I thought. In between well, the point I'm trying to get is uh -huh. that one location, that one location in the two years I've been here has changed names three times. Okay? So you said to me, is it the same building uh, about the temple? But I don't. I I'm don't. trying to say it's the same spot. The spot, maybe that's what I should it's have It's the same said. land. Same spot. Yeah. But, you know, they took the temple out, and then they built another one. They took the temple yeah. out, and then they built another one. Yeah. You know, they keep doing that. But it's the it's same geographical spot. That's what, I'm, that's what I meant. Okay, so in verse 5, it talks about a pair of scales. Yeah. And John MacArthur says the common measuring device, which is two small trays hung um, from each end of a balance beam, indicates the scarcity of food will lead to rationing and food lines. Um, how many of you remember the gas rationing? One, two, three? In 79, you mean, somewhere around there? Yeah. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. I can remember getting up 5 o'clock in the morning to get in line, and uh, you, you, the, some people went Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Some people went Tuesday, Thursday. And I was driving back and forth between Baltimore, Washington every day to go to Bible college. So I'm, I need a lot of gas. And, and I was in line and in line. And, and I was late for school a couple of times. Pam and I were, were at Washington Bible College in the district. And uh, what a crazy thing that was. 
Well, in the tribulation, there's going to be lines and food rationing where, you know, it's going to be difficult to just just pop up the Aldi's and, you know, buy bread and milk. It's, it's going to be very, very difficult. So well, they, ration, they rationed toilet paper last last year. Yeah, 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 right, yeah right. they did. Yeah, That's, you better they, not have an urgent need or a big family. Yeah, they still, the, a couple weeks ago, they made me put one back. I had gotten two, and they made me put one back. See? Like, not even that long ago. Yeah, toilet paper, yeah. yeah. Or even, even medical care, like I was telling you earlier. You sit in the ER, in their waiting room for hours and hours and hours trying to get help. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's there. going to be it's going to be difficult. Then it says a, uh, in verse 6, it talks about a quart of wheat. John MacArthur says the approximate amount necessary to sustain one person for one day. A quart of wheat is one person for one day. Then it uses the uh, word denarius. Some of you read that, said penny. Um, and that is in verse 6 also. And I'm looking at verse 6. A quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius. And that denarius uh, in first century Palestine was one day's normal wages. So think about what... Um, a person, an average person, makes per day in America. Uh, that's what a denarius was in first century Palestine under Roman occupation. Okay, so that's one day's normal wages. One day's work will provide enough food for only one person. So it's it's going to be it's going to be difficult. It's going to be difficult. How many of you? Uh, I don't think there's anybody here that could remember the Depression, but uh, your parents did, I'm sure, yeah. right? And many of you have read about the Depression, know about the Depression, know the history, what happened, and how difficult it was, and, and it was a, a very difficult time. It's going to be more difficult during the Tribulation period. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I mentioned something, I mean, I think to let me see what time it was. But I remember when my kids were little, and uh, I remember asparagus. It was so expensive, fresh asparagus. And you didn't see it much at all on the grocery shelves. I remember buying a can of asparagus because I was hungry for it, you know, and it was like $2.99 a can. But I, and now you see it all year long. And I think about all the food in all these stores. It was kind of it's cheaper now to buy it than it was. Yeah, before. I don't remember. It was you can get it one ninety nine. And that was back in the sixties, you know. Like. Okay. Good. Good. Then it talks about three quarts of barley, and um, three quarts of barley. The Godfrey said that barley is usually fed to animals. Uh, this grain was low in nutrients and cheaper than wheat. And a day's wages provided enough for only a small family's daily supply. Three quarts of barley would feed one family for one day. And then it says about the oil and the wine in verse 6. And in verse 6 it says, do not harm the oil and wine. Uh, any thoughts on that? Okay, well, MacArthur says in his study guide about that, which I think is really, really good, although the point could be made that these foods will not be affected by the famine, a more straightforward meaning is that they are the bare staples, the bare essentials. What was oil used for? Oil was used in the preparation of bread, and wine was considered necessary for cooking, and for purifying water. So wine was really important, not just for drinking, but for cooking and for purifying water. Uh, and oil and wine suddenly will become luxuries and have to be carefully protected. I mean, how do you make bread 
without yeast? How do you make bread without oil? How do you make bread without some of those basic things? And so um, the oil and the wine was spared in this. But the bare staples will become luxuries. And then in verses 7 and 8, it talks about this pale horse. And I have an error on your sheet. See that word, C-H-O-L-O-R-O-S? That doesn't exist. Cross it out. That's a typo. And I'm going to give you the correct spelling. It's C-H-L-O-R-O-S. Chloros. Okay? And um, it's... We get our English word chlorophyll from that chloros, which is a Greek word. And um, for that pale horse, John says chloros, the Greek word from which we get the English word chlorophyll, comes and describes the pale, ashen green pallor characteristic of decomposition of a corpse. So that pale horse... The, the, the paleness is kind of like a, a, a muted green, kind of like a, like algae, like you would see on a swimming pool. And it yeah. speaks of uh, decomposition. It speaks of, uh, of death. Okay? God grants the horsemen the authority to bring death to 25% of the world's population and then it says Hades, verse 8, is the place of the dead, which is identified as a common uh, and fitting partner for death. So we see uh, these seals are coming out um, one at a time. Now, do you remember the acronym I gave you last time? I said STB, STB, not STP, the racer's edge. Everybody knows STP, right? The Razor's Edge. Putting the oil in your, in your car. I was oh, thinking oh. of a band. Oh. <laughs> I thought of a band. A band! Yeah. Yeah. Well, it does have a kick to it. <laughs> yeah. In my first career, when I graduated from high school, I went to automotive school and graduated. And I worked as a mechanic for a number of years. And I used to rebuild engines. In the day, STP was uh, really uh, kind of the, the bread and butter of mechanics. I mean, uh, you didn't use STP, you know, you were from outer, outer space. Want a job? <laughs> What's that? Want a job? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little rusty. I still got a lot of the tools, and I remember a lot of the stuff, but my hands, I get up in the morning like this, and I have to... <clears throat> Open, I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. I have to literally open my fingers up in the morning because my fingers get like this. And I asked my doctor about it, and he said, old age. I said, thank you. Thanks for your expert help. <laughs> okay. Of course, you know, you know, when I'm working with the guys on Saturday morning, I'm part of the the cooking crew, I'm, I'm also a cook, that was my second career. Uh, I worked as a chef in Washington, D.C. when I was in college because my mother taught me how to cook and I've always liked to cook and I've always cooked a lot. So, uh, so uh, um, I forgot where I was going with that. What was I saying before I mentioned cooking? Well, I was talking STB. about mechanics. You, STB. STB yeah, does. well, let's get back to the STB and forget the metaphors. <laughs> STB, what did I say it stands for? I said to memorize this, seals, trumpets, oh. Oh, yeah. bowls. Yeah, they occur right. in that order in the Revelation. And I'm going to tell you, you're going to get mixed up. You're going to get confused, because I get confused. I've been studying this 45 years, and I still get confused. Seals, trumpets, and bowls. And you'll see how all that works later on. But we're at the seals part, and we're at seal number, um, let's see, the fiery red, the, uh, the pale horse. And we have a little ways to go. So let's compare two verses of Scripture. Could I have two readers? We don't all need to turn there because of time. Could I have one person read 118, Revelation 118? Just give me a hand real quick. Anybody? 118, Pam. And 20 in verse 3. 
20 and verse 3. And then I'm going to keep going while they're turning. I'm just going to do 20 and verse 3. Pastor Jensen? Okay, while they're turning to those two verses, look over to page 3, and you'll see the fifth seal. And I have created a chart, and I want to explain that chart a little bit. Does everybody see that big chart I made? Yeah. So I have the word tribulation spread out horizontally, and then vertically I have those uh, symbols. Does anybody know what that symbol is? Omega. What is it? Omega. Omega. It's the Greek letter yeah. Omega. Yeah. Jesus said, I am the Alpha and the, the Omega, omega. Yeah. the beginning and the last, the first and the last. The Omega is the last letter in the Greek alphabet. By the way, I'm not too happy with the way they named this new um, COVID strain. They're calling it what? Omicron. And what is an Omicron, Ashley? Oh, uh, it sounds like a transformer to me. I don't know. I'm sorry? It sounds like a transformer. I don't know. I don't know what it is. It's another Greek letter. It's the short O. Oh. It's the short. Uh, there's two O's in Greek. Yeah. And, and Omicron is another Greek letter. And I said to Pam, why are they picking on our Greek language? Why did they oh, name it something else yeah. instead of a Greek letter? Well, yeah. it's supposed to be something else. But they should name it something else than that. But in any case, uh, this is the Omega. So, tribulation across, the right. Omega is going down. And the, the line for the Omega going down is to show you the separation in the tribulation period. So, how many halves are there? Two. Two, right? The first half of the tribulation, the second half of the tribulation. Okay, the first half of the tribulation, if you want to write it in your sheet, I don't have it written, it's three and a half years. And the second half is also three and a half years. Okay, and it's real important that you get this in your head so that you're looking at the whole span of the tribulation, but there's a line this way, and in the middle, that's called mid-trib. And that'll be important to learn later on. Because later on, I'm gonna, we're going to be talking about the views uh, of the millennium. And you're going to learn that mid-trib and, and also the views of the tribulation, mid-trib is going to be a position. So the tribulation is seven years. Split it in half, three and a half, three and a half. And if you want to write it in there now, to get a little jump start, on the second half of the tribulation, it has another name in the Old Testament. And it is called, and this is a quote, the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. We're not going to look at the scripture right now on, on that. I'm just trying to give you a heads up. And we'll look at it all more detail later on. All right, any questions on what I said about the chart so far? So let's go back to the scripture. Could I have 118? And the living one and I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever more, and I have the keys of death and of Hades. I have the keys of death and Hades. What do you think keys is indicating there? It's in charge of, in control of. Control of, okay. Another another word, that's true. Control of, what else? Another word, another way to say it. So if you have the control of it, you have the... Responsibility. Responsibility. Authority. Authority. That's the word I was looking for. But all of that is true. All of that is correct. Okay, and 20 in verse 3. Okay, and for context, this is about Satan when he's bound for the thousand years. It says, and they threw him in the, into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. And who did that? God. God. Does he have that authority? He has all authority, yeah. doesn't he? Yeah. So Jesus says in 118, I have the keys to death and Hades. And here you see God in chapter 20 and verse 3, where he has um, taken that usurper, he has taken that deceiver, he has taken that liar, he has taken that murderer, 
and he has dealt with them, at least temporarily. Because as he said, he's cast in that pit for a thousand years, but he is going to be released. So make no mistake, as powerful as Satan is, and he is powerful, and as awesome and wicked and uh, controlling as Satan is, make sure you know, make sure you get it, he is under the auspices, he is under the authority, he is under the power of who? God. God, Almighty God, Creator God, Father God, Lord God, Almighty. God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. He's omniscient. He's all knowledgeable. He's omnipotent. He's all powerful. And no matter where you are in the scripture from Genesis to Revelation, you always have the conflict and the war, the spiritual warfare between the good God, the creator God, and that one, one, uno, uno, one fallen angel named Lucifer or Satan and I have another dozen names for you from the scripture. And when he was cast out of heaven, he took a horde of angels with him. Just like in the tribulation period, where the world will follow the Antichrist, where the world will believe the false prophet, where the world will pledge loyalty to that world system, so these angels, a third, it says, of them, and if you remember from previous Bible studies, it said there were myriads and myriads. One passage says it's 10,000 time, 10, times 10,000. So how many angels are there? We don't know. We don't have a number. But there are millions and billions and trillions and whatever other numbers there are. I'm not sure what else there is. A third of them went with him. So he has an army of wickedness. And they all will come into play as we continue on in the Revelation. And you'll see them and what they're doing. Okay. So we're at the top of page three. And we're at the fifth seal. And we're in verse nine. Anybody have any questions so far? Okay. Would someone like to read verse 9? And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Thank you. Thank you. So, um... So this fifth seal, John MacArthur explains it this way. John says this seal describes the force of the saints' prayers for God's vengeance. Its events will begin the first half and mark the midpoint and events following in the seven-year period that is called the Great Tribulation. The second three-and-one-half year period features the Day of the Lord, in which God unleashes his judgment and wrath on earth in intensifying waves. And that's where you get the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls. Some people say to me, we will, some people say to me when I explain this, well, which is worse? Which is more severe? Okay? Well, the answer to that is very simple. It starts this big, and then it's getting this big. Okay, so it's ascending. Okay, and those of you that know music know that in music there's a, a symbol for ascending mm -hmm. when you're singing. Okay, and I think it's that like greater than sign. I think. Mm -hmm. Is it? Okay, and, and that's what's going to happen. Things are going to be awful to begin. As it continues, they're going to be despicable. And as it continues, they're going to be unbelievably awful. Bear, unbearable. You say, well, wow, that's, that's terrible, that's awful. Well, you're right, and it is. And it doesn't have to be. All man has to do 
is what God told him to do. Do you remember that? Do you remember what God said? God told Adam, be fruitful and multiply and subdue the earth. That's all he had to do. Really? Is it that, is it that hard? Really? But man has chosen to turn his back on God. They've taken prayer out of schools. You know that. They've, uh, they're trying to take Christ out of Christmas in some organizations. In some organizations, uh, I saw something on the internet where a football team was forbidden, forbidden to have a word of prayer, and the whole team knelt down and prayed. Did anybody see that? Wow. They're regulating worship of people. And... Um, it's because of that hard-heartedness, it's because of that rebellion that man suffers and will suffer more in time. And the simple answer is to accept the invitation that God gives. And I think I'm going to close with the invitation, and I'm going to read it. And it's something you know, but and it's something familiar but I think it's worth reading anyways. John 3, 16, 17, and 18. All three verses go together. And to me, I mean, why do we have to have all of this suffering? Why do we even have to have this tribulation period? Well, we wouldn't if man would just do what God said to do. Revelate, uh, John chapter 3, verse 16, 17, and 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. It's that simple, ladies and gentlemen. It's that simple. But the hardness of heart and the rebellion and not willing to listen to authority and to say that, that God not only doesn't exist, but God cannot exist. And that's what science says. Okay, that's what non-Christian science says. Non-Christian science says that the universe is a closed system. Christian science says that the universe is an open system. If the system is open, then God can exist. But if the system is closed, God cannot exist. So if you take that and, and talk to uh, a scientist uh, who is not a believer, he or she will explain to you that the reason they don't believe is not because they don't believe God, but because they don't believe that God can exist. It's impossible, according to the way they think, because of their closed system thinking. And um, I didn't make this up, and this is not a sermon. This is right out of uh, uh, science, and I uh, learned this in seminary, uh, and also in Bible college, and... Um, it's so closed-mindedness that um, they don't even believe that God can exist. It's impossible for God to exist. It's hard to believe anybody could believe that. I think it takes more faith not to believe in God than it does to believe in God. I mean, you've heard the watch story. Okay, this is a citizen's watch. And uh, according to scientific theory that's man-centered and uh, without God, uh, they believe that things just kind of fell together and bam, they were created. That, that's the explanation behind creation. Well, you know that that's not so. You know that this company, somebody in this company designed this watch. And you all have watches <coughs> or glasses, and it's designed. And this world was created by design, too. So no, it did not just pop out of nowhere and a whole bunch of molecules floating in the universe just all of a sudden, bam, 
That's the Big Bang Theory, by the way. You know, you've heard that? Bang! And here's the planet. Wow. It takes more faith to believe that than to believe that there's a creator God that created it. Jason likes that one. Okay. we got to close. I am grateful that you're here tonight. Thank you so much. God bless you. And have a safe trip home.